Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Luke Cobray. I don't want to talk to you just a little subject that's close to my heart, and we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, inspiration. It really came from the stubbing or the breaking, I don't know yet, I'm not too chicken to know, of my toe. But I want to talk to you about a subject that the title tonight is Lasting Joy. Lasting Joy, you know, because... We all search for happiness, and like it said, life is a, is a journey, enjoy the ride, and when was the last time we took a joy ride? And, and I want to take you with me just uh, to look at some thoughts and to look at some things out of the Word of God and looking at this subject of lasting joy. And if you've got your Bibles, I want you to just go with me to the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, Ecclesiastes is right there, Psalms, Proverbs, turn a couple pages after Proverbs, it's right there. The book of Ecclesiastes, often credited... With, uh, being, as being written, it's human author, it's divine inspiration is the Holy Spirit. It's human author is oftentimes in the, within the church accredited to being written by King Solomon. Uh, scholars oftentimes debate that, but for, as a whole, the, the Christian, uh, Christian belief kind of stands on the Ecclesiastes being written by Solomon. Today I want to look at just an interesting section of Scripture, a very complicated book. There's a lot of... Uh, uh, of deep meanings in this book and, and, and talking about the, the vanities of life. But I was reading through this and I was just studying and, and, and in, my, in my studies I came across this and I was just, just really struck a chord with me in Ecclesiastes in the second chapter. I'm going to read a couple of verses, actually quite a few verses, just to kind of point out something here that what we believe to be King Solomon is writing. And beginning in the second chapter, really all the way through the or second chapter, all the way through the first verse, but I'll begin in verse number three. It says, I've searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine while guiding my heart with wisdom and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the sons of men to do under heaven all the days of their life. Verse number four, he says, I made my works great. I built myself houses, and I planted myself vineyards. I made myself gardens and orchards, and I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made myself water pools from which the, to water the growing trees for the grove. I acquired male and female servants, and I even had servants born in my house. Yes, I had great possessions of herds and flocks, and then all who were in Jerusalem before me. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the special treasures of kings and of the provinces. I acquired male and female singers, the delights of the sons of men and musical instruments of all kinds. And so I became great and, ex and excelled more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. For my heart rejoiced in all of my labor. And this was the reward from all of my labor. And then I looked on all the works that my hands had done. And on the labor in which I had toiled. He goes on and he says... And indeed, all was vanity and grasping for, this, for the wind. There was no profit under the sun. Here this author, the preacher, or whoever it is, as attributed to King Solomon, is saying, I've, I've done everything that you can do. I've had everything that you can have. I've searched for everything that can be searched for. I've, I've, I've allowed myself every pleasure, every comfort, every, everything that I would want. I've acquired much. I've experienced much, and the reward was my heart rejoiced in these labors, but then I found in the terms of my life that it was all vanity, like grasping for the wind, knowing that we cannot contain it, we cannot hold on to it, but rather it slips through our fingers all throughout our lives. And I was thinking about this scripture, and I was thinking about my own life, and I was thinking, you know, I've searched in my own life, in my pursuits, in my hobbies, in my interests, in my loves, and I found that I've never been fully satisfied by any of those things. I've gone from one thing to the next. I've acquired, I've searched, I've sought, and I've never been able to say it's brought me lasting joy. It might be temporary joy, pleasant memories, but nothing that I can say that I am completely content with in my life. 
And I can venture to say that you have experienced the same. That you've sought after things. That you thought, well, if I could only have this, or if I could only get this, or if I, if I could only acquire this much, or if I could only have this much in my savings, or if I could only get that kind of a job, or if I could only wear these kind of clothes, or drive that kind of a car, or if I could only have 2.5 children in a, in, a, in, a white, in a house with a white picket fence with a green lawn, then my life would be happy and that my soul would, would rest and I would say, man, I've got joy and I've got peace. I could venture to say that you've searched, you've sought, You've bought, and yet still, there's a longing. There's an emptiness on the inside. Because you see, the things that we look for as humanity, the things that we seek after, the things that we, we toil and we turmoil over and that we strive to achieve and that we hold on to, it's like grasping the wind. It might be a good moment. It might be a good memory. It might be a, a, a season of joy or something that brings us happiness and contentment, but nothing that we can do on our own, nothing that we could search out or seek would give us that lasting joy that I so desire. And I know you do too. Here's Solomon. If there's anybody that can say they had earthly pleasures, confirms it by saying it's like holding on to or trying to hold on to the wind and ride the journey. But yet we can't grab a hold of it. So then what do we think about the subject of enjoy the ride and let go and flip out and wipe out and, 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 and let loose? And what do we talk about this subject of looking for lasting joy, joy that, that goes beyond a moment of, uh, of pleasure, joy goes beyond, you know, a good memory? What do we say? Do we say then as humanity or as, 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 as humans that, well, this is just the way it is? This is just as good as it gets. I'll take what I can and I'll enjoy the ride and I'll, you know, when life gives me lemons, I'll make lemonade. Or is there really something that we can do? Is there really something that we can look for or we can search for that would give us or bring us lasting joy? Something that goes beyond just a moment. Something that goes beyond just a, 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 you know, a, a pleasant memory. Something goes beyond a parent being pleased with their child one moment and, and having to discipline them the next. That goes beyond the, the, the pleasure of a raise or a bonus or a, or a new job. And, and over the months and the, the years that wears off and all of a sudden we lose what we once had. Is there, is there something more? And in looking at this and in studying this and in, and in literally in my own heart, in my own life, crying out to God, God, I need something else. I need something more. I found some things about where. I think I have on there where, what, but I'm going to change that if you guys can't to where does lasting joy come from? Where does lasting joy come from? We know that temporary joy comes from our children, from our husbands or our wives, or temporary joy comes from seeing a good movie or having a good laugh. Temporary joy comes from that new car smell. Temporary joy comes from the first time we buy a house. Temporary joy comes from the, the nice weather or the pleasant vacation. But you know, life goes on, moves on, and that new car breaks down. That new house ends up deteriorating, or the lawn dies, or you get a gopher that you can't, you can't find, you can't stop. Whatever it might be, there's always something that tries to steal and to rise to rob, or life moves in and replaces that with something else. So where then does lasting joy come from? And today in my studies, I, I, I found some things. I was looking for some things and seeking after God and asking some questions in my own heart. And I say that this is, I'm preaching to myself tonight. So if you don't get anything, that's cool. Because I'm totally just going to preach to myself because this is something that I, I needed to get in my own life. Where does lasting joy come from? I, I, I've got four little things that I want to just talk about. Things that we can look at what the Bible says about lasting joy. What the Bible says about true joy, real joy. Not material joy, but joy in God. And today I want to look at those things and they all start with an F because I tried to be smart and I tried to, tried to be crafty. So they all start with an F. And where does lasting joy come from? And the very first thing I want to talk about is the, where does lasting joy come from? The very first thought is lasting joy comes from following Jesus. Lasting joy. Joy that goes beyond a moment. Joy that goes beyond just a, an experience. Joy that goes beyond you know, a pleasant memory or, or being pleased as a parent. Joy that goes beyond looking at your bank account saying, man, finally, it's going up and not down. Whatever it might be, lasting joy that spans our life comes from following Jesus. 
You see, there's this term that we hear all throughout the, Old, or the New Testament that you and I, when we are in the body of Christ, are literally to be found in Christ. As though we are inside of Christ. Or we are in Christ. Although Christ is in us, we are in Christ. And what that means is that when we are in Christ, that means that whatever is true of Christ or of Jesus is true of us. As if you could imagine it like this. Think of it just like this for a moment. If, if you could have a, a big jar, like a big mason jar, and we'll label it Jesus. You and I are like water filled inside of that mason jar, Jesus, when we're in Christ. Therefore, whatever, whatever is true of that jar is true of us. Why? Because we are in that jar, right? If that jar was labeled this or that jar was labeled that, that's what we are because we are in Christ. So therefore, if Jesus, who for the joy set before him, endured and followed and finished his race, then what is true for Jesus, the joy set before him, then is true for you and I. So lasting joy comes from following Jesus. Do you remember the account of the woman at the well? When Jesus was sitting at the well in the book of John and, and the lady comes up with a pitcher and he says, he says, woman, draw me some water. And she says, well, where's your, where's your cup? You don't have a pot. You, you don't have anything to get water from he goes on and he says, listen, the, the water from this well only lasts for a moment. But he says, I have water that I offer to you, that I want to give to you, that if you take of this water, you'll never thirst again. And she says, man, I want this water. I want this water. Now, Jesus wasn't literally speaking of water, H2O. Jesus was speaking of living water of the Spirit of God, of, of following Him, of becoming a, a follower of Christ, of, of finding ourselves in Christ. And He says, when we are in Christ, we are like this water from a well that never thirsts again, but yet we are overflowing with what is true of Jesus. And I think that's such a neat statement that He says, I give this to you. It's a gift I want to offer to you. In the same book, in the book of John, if you've got your Bible, just go with me real quick. John in the 15th chapter, super cool chapter. Jesus is talking to his disciples and he really, really gives them a neat analogy here in John the 15th chapter. He, he gives them the analogy that he is a vine, like a grape vine. I can imagine that Jesus and his disciples are walking in through the garden and perhaps they're walking through the vineyards. And as he's walking through the vineyards, he says, I am the vine, you are are the branches, the, the shoots, that which bears fruit. He goes on, he says, for without me, you can do nothing. He says, if you're in me, you'll bear fruit. If you abide in me, he says, if you are in me to live, stay and dwell in me, you will bear much fruit. He says, I'll prune you so that you'll bear even more fruit. But I love this statement in John the 15th chapter. Verse number 11, he says these things. He says, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, that your joy may be full. Did you notice that Jesus says, these things, I am the vine, you are the branches, abide in me and you will bear much fruit. He says, these things I have spoken to you. He doesn't say that joy, your joy may remain full. He says that my joy, you see on the capital M, that's the joy of Jesus Christ. So he says, these things I have spoken to you, that the joy that is in Jesus Christ himself would be in us. So if there's something more, Jesus had a connection to God. Jesus had a direct line in a relationship with God. And therefore, he had an understanding of life. Therefore, as the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, the joy that was set before him. So now that joy that was set before him by his relationship, by his position in God, he says, my joy would remain in you. That your, that's you and I, you and I, we're your, that your joy would be full. Lasting joy comes from following Jesus. You know what's so cool is in John the 17th chapter, Jesus is now alone, praying for his disciples, for the followers of Christ, people like you and I. And John in the 17th chapter, he goes and he says this again. He says, but I come to you. He's talking to God. He says, in these things I speak in the world that they, you and I, the disciples, may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. You see, joy, lasting joy, true joy, not momentary, not material, not just a pleasant memory, not just a fun thought, not just a, a chuckle or a, or a giggle, but joy that gets us through the good and the bad, 
Joy that endures all things from the beginning to the end of our life. True and lasting joy comes when we follow Jesus Christ. Why? Because we find ourselves in Christ and therefore His joy is in us. His joy is in us. Peter, in the book of 1 Peter, I'm just going to quote this to go. Book of 1 Peter, in the, in the first chapter, Peter says this. He says that, In this you greatly rejoice that now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Sorry, you've got some hard times. You've got some, some the world or life is pressing against you. And he goes on, he says, That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold, that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation that life is good, at the revelation that you got that car, at the revelation that you finally got the house, at the revelation that your kids are doing well, at the revelation that you're living the American dream, at the revelation of that song that touched you, at the revelation of this or that. No, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And he goes on and he says, that whom have, you, uh, whom have not seen you love, though you do not see him, yet believing, listen to this, you rejoice, what? With joy, inexpressible. Why is it inexpressible joy? Because it's not your joy. It's the joy of Jesus Christ on the inside of you. You can't express it. You, you, you can't explain it. You, you can't even contain it. Why? Because it's joy with inexpressible and full of glory. The joy of Jesus Christ comes. Lasting joy. Lasting joy comes from following Jesus, we talked about this last week on Sunday morning, if you were here, talking about drawing close and, and, and getting close to God and how this is, everything falls into place when we really, literally seek after God. And joy is one of those things that comes into our life when we, when we press into God and we say, God, through Jesus, I need to follow you. I want to look at you. I, I want to I do what you do. I want to say what you say. What, where you go, I'll go. Whom you serve, I'll serve. Whom you love, I'll love. And we begin to press into God all of a sudden, joy inexpressible shows in our lives because we follow Jesus. Lasting joy comes from Jesus. Amen. Where does lasting joy come from? Following Jesus. Where does lasting joy come from? The filling of the Spirit. Lasting joy comes from the filling of the Spirit of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us, filling us, overflowing within us. Joy comes. You see, in humanity, the subject or the idea of true love is, is something that moves us. We've written plays about it. We've, we've watched movie after movie after movie about true love. We've even seen fairy tales where no matter what the forces of darkness or evil had to throw at them, that true love conquered all. So we have this idea that we seek after this true love is filling everything in our lives. But you see, when it comes to the love of man, true love is unobtainable. It's, 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 it's not necessarily the only thing or the, the thing that would bring us lasting joy. Why? Because men come and go. Because love comes and it's gone. And because people, they come and they go, they forget or, or they move or they change. Somebody dies or, or life continues on. And though there might be a, a love for that person well after they're gone, that relationship, that, that unity, that, that bond that was there is no longer there. I mean, things like the notebook where the husband was so faithful, even though the wife and the, they look back to their person. Those are great in the movies. And they make our hearts cry because that's what we long for. But we realize that when we seek for love, when we look for the love of man, whether it be with a spouse or whether it be friendship or whatever it might be, that men will always come and go. But there is a true love that is obtainable for you and I. There is a true love that is obtainable for you and I. It has the true love of God the Father to us. And we have and experience and feel and develop and operate in that true love that will never let us down through one way, the Holy Spirit in our lives. You see, as men, as humanity, we are not capable of knowing God. We, we don't have it in us. Why? Because God said, I will make them in my image. But God did not say, I will make them like me. You think of it like this. You see airplanes in the sky. 
And they might even look like they're on the same path that you look up at the sky and you say, man, there's two airplanes. They're going to crash. They're going to hit each other. But then you realize that they're on two different fields at two different elevations and they cross each other and they're not even close because they're literally thousands of feet apart. That's like us and God. We are literally on a different elevation than God. You think of it like this. It's when I say as humanity, we're not capable of knowing God. It's like this. Uh, my dog is not capable of knowing me. My dog might have emotion for me and, and what emotion it can express if it can. My dog can know if I'm happy. It could know if I'm sad. It can know if I'm mad at it because I say bad dog. But you see, my dog will never know my desires, will never know my heart, will never know the deepest and the, and, and, and the, and the, and the, the cries of my life because it's on a different level. But you see, as man is disconnected from God because of sin nature, we're not on the same level of God. We can experience true love, unfailing love between God and man because the Holy Spirit that comes and fills us on the inside now is God living on the inside of us. And now we have a relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. And we have gone from knowing who God is to now knowing God on an intimate level and experiencing this true love, this love that won't die, this love that doesn't walk away, this love that doesn't change its mind, this love that isn't based on something or, or the circumstances or on, on whether or not I love in return. This is a love of God to His creation through the Holy Spirit on the inside of us because of Jesus Christ. Now we can experience this true, this real love. And because of that, oh, we have this joy that lasts in our life. In the book of Romans, if you've got your Bibles, you can turn there with me. Romans in the 15th chapter. Oh man, some cool stuff here. Romans in the 15th chapter. Paul the Apostle is writing to the church, kind of in his closing thoughts here. He says this in Romans in the 15th chapter, verse number 13. He says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy. Fill you with all joy. Remember we talked about being filled in the Spirit. Fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope. How? By the power of the Holy Spirit. May the God of all hope fill you with all joy. The Bible tells us in, in the book of Galatians in the fifth chapter that the fruit of the Spirit you guys might know this, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, kindness. It goes on. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. What is fruit? Fruit is physical evidence. It's DNA evidence. You see, Jesus even said it himself. He says, a, a, a tree like this can't produce a fruit like that. An orange tree can't produce apples. An apple tree can't produce figs. A fig tree doesn't produce a grapefruit. A tree produces after its own. And he goes on, he says, you will know a tree by its fruit. And so here, Paul is talk, talking to the church. And he says, the fruit, the evidence, the DNA of what's inside of us is love, is joy, lasting joy. Because when we live and operate according to the Spirit of God, and when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, and we have a unison and a connection to God in our lives, and we realize, hey, I know the living and the Almighty God through Jesus Christ. I have experienced undying, unfailing love. All of a sudden, something happens. We can't contain it. Why? Because it's the physical evidence in our lives. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. is joy in our lives. Fruit is evidence. DNA evidence. Where does lasting joy come? It comes from following Jesus. It comes from filling the Spirit. Filling of the Spirit. Where does lasting joy come from? Lasting joy comes from finding the Word. Finding the Word. You see, joy has to be maintained. If it didn't have to be maintained, we wouldn't have to maintain it, right? You wouldn't keep looking for it. If, 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 if it was something that, wow, boom, God just dropped joy on me, like just dropped it from heaven like manna, pow! Then we wouldn't have to do anything again. We wouldn't have to look at anything. We wouldn't have to search for anything. We wouldn't have to continue to go in it. But see, joy has to be maintained. Why does joy have to be maintained? You've experienced it just like I've experienced it. Because one moment we're happy, the next moment we're not. Joy has to be maintained. It has to be something that we continually feed in our own lives. 
As a matter of fact, we see this in, in, in the writings of, of John in the book of 1 John. John in, the first, in 1 John, the first chapter, verse number 4, John says, I write these things. What I'm writing to you, I write that your joy may be full. So we have got to maintain our joy. We have got to fill our joy. Just like we seek for happiness, we look for, for, for solutions, we look for fulfillment in our lives, we look for our hobbies and we look for our loves and we look for, for this or for that or whatever it might be. We have got to fill our joy and it is found in the Word. True joy comes by finding the Word, the Word of God. It's like a gas tank. You know, I wish that we could figure out a way to fill up our cars one time. Wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't that just solve like all the problems of the world right there? No more gas. One tank is all you need for the rest of your life, the rest of the life of your car. You never have to fill up again. But you and I know we have to go to the gas station, sometimes on a daily basis. Sometimes we don't have enough to fill up the tank. Sometimes we've only got a little bit. Well, what will three dollars get me? And okay, every little drop, and we're, 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 you know, you know, you're like me probably, right? When you go to the gas station, you don't let that little drop out, right? You tap it on there and you make sure you hold it. And I even put the hose up just in case there's a little bit of residue in the hose. Our joy has to be maintained and it comes by finding the Word of God, by getting into the Word of God, by looking at what the Word of God says about us, about our circumstances, about our situations, by reading what the Word of God is, but speaking the Word of God over our lives. That is when fulfillment comes. That is when, when joy, a lasting joy comes. Why? Because no longer do we look at what the world says. No longer do we look at the situation. No longer do we look at the circumstance. Now we look at the Word of God and our life is based off of the Word of God. In the book of Jeremiah, I'll go ahead and put it up on the overhead for you. Jeremiah in the 15th chapter, the prophet Jeremiah says, he says, your words were found and I ate them. I love this picture that he paints. I ate them and your word was to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Your word was found, and I gobbled it up. I took it in. I held it. I took every last bit, like, we've, like you hear Pastor Dan often talking about. The word of God, it's not fast food. It's not like McDonald's, the 20-piece chicken nugget for $1.99, where it's like, man, I don't care how it tastes. Let me just shovel as much as I can in before I start tasting it. The word of God is like that rich, expensive, Michelin star chef cooked cuisine that you want to just, you want to soak up every little bit of, so I, even when the, when the plate is gone, you say, man, I'm at a fancy restaurant, I don't care, and you pick up the plate and you start licking. <laughs> Jeremiah, oftentimes referred to as the prophet of doom. Jeremiah suffered depression because of the calling of God on his life. He had such a, a, a message for, the, for Israel that oftentimes he had a heavy heart. Oftentimes there was, there was just such a, a weight on him. And here's a man that is going through a, 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 a hard calling by God. And he says, but I found your word. I found your word. And when I found it, man, I licked the plate clean. And because of that, the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Lasting joy comes from the word of God. I was talking, I told you, I'd tell you a little bit more about my toe and why the whole premise of tonight's message came is because last night, last afternoon really, I got home and I decided, okay, it's time, I can't escape it, even though every year I try, I, it was time for me to put up the Christmas lights. Oh, everybody else on my corner and my street had already done it and I was like, I can't be the only house that's like bah humbug that waits till December 24th because that would be me. If it was left up to me, I would have like the Charlie Brown Christmas tree, you know, like the little tiny one that was from like last year. That would be me. I'm not a Christmas decoration guy. So last night I put up my Christmas lights and I'm on the ladder and I'm stapling and, and as I'm finishing up and my, my son, my little boy Bjorn, he pulled out all the lights he could find. I mean, literally I had a box of Christmas lights and he kept pulling them out and he was like, Dad, what are we going to do with these? And I'm like, I already put them up on the house. And he's like, well, where are we going to put these? And I'm like, all right, well, wrap them around that bush. And all right, and then he'd come over with another thing. Dad, where are we going to put these lights? And it's like, oh, man. And I wrap those ones up. And then he'd find another thing of lights. Dad, what about these lights? And it's like, dude, how many lights do we have? 
And we were wrapping it up, and it was getting dark, and I was walking through the garage, getting ready to clean everything up, and I have this, this saw that's on the ground. It's made out of cast iron. It's real heavy, and I had sandals on. It's walking through the garage, and it's all full of all the junk because I'm not one of those people that keeps my garage really clean. And I was walking through, and right then, just direct contact with that cast iron saw, just right into the toe. I mean, I screamed. As a matter of fact, I told my wife afterwards, I said, babe, I now understand how you feel. I now know what it feels like to have a baby. I have broken my toe. Pain inexpressible. It came in waves, much like contractions, and I thought, okay, I can relate. Now when you talk about the pain of childbirth, I can say I've been there with you. You know, the interesting thing was, after I hit my toe, my day was ruined. Literally, my wife will tell you, I, I was in a slump. It was like 6 o'clock. There was still plenty of, there was no more daylight left, but there was still plenty of hours left in our day. And I just sat on the couch with my ice bag whimpering. And the kids, they were doing their thing, and they'd come over and play with me, Daddy. Daddy's foot hurts. Play with me, Daddy. Swing me, Daddy. Daddy's foot hurts. So finally, it's time to go to bed. We all go up and then we have a routine of getting everybody's teeth brushed and jammies on and all that, you know, parents with their kids and do that. And I just crawled up to bed in the fetal position and just fell asleep, left my wife to do it all. And I thought to myself, why am I so depressed about my tone? It's because I was thinking, man, in my mind, I was feeding myself, well, I can't do this. And my weekend, Monday and Tuesday is coming up and I had this plan and I wanted to do this and now I can't do that anymore. I'm preaching on Sunday night and I'm going to be walking with my gangster limp and everybody's going to be making fun of me. My toe's purple. My toenail's purple. I'm going to probably have to get one of those needles and pop it. And oh, I just, I can't. And I'm thinking about all these horrible things and it just got me so down. I thought, man, that's exactly our condition. Is that we look so much to what's going on around, well, I can't do this and all oh, this situation here and all oh, my kids are going this way or, or my money. I, I had money. Had, my car was new, but then my windshield got cracked or that guy hit my door or, or whatever it might be. And we start looking at all the different circumstances. We start looking at all the different things and it's like a switch gets flipped in our life. And it's so easy to look at those things. And like Jeremiah, it's so easy to look at what he had, what God had assigned him to do, what God had told him to do. But yet he says, I found your word and I ate it. And when we begin to speak the Word of God, when we begin to speak life over our life, when we begin to speak what the Word of God says about us, then all of a sudden something happens to us. And there's this joy that overcomes us. There's this, there's this understanding that says, no, I have got to feed my faith. I've got to keep going. I've got to hold on to. I've got to maintain my joy. I can't rely on yesterday to keep today's joy. But when I find the Word of God, man, something happens. Something happens in my life, and that's called lasting joy because I found the Word of God in my life. Last thought for tonight is, where does lasting joy come from? Lasting joy comes from, this is a cool one, lasting joy comes from faith in God. Lasting joy comes from faith in God. Why? Because it might look like it's a hopeless situation. It might look like it's a stormy night. It might look like there's a rough and a bumpy road ahead. It might look like there's no hope for tomorrow. But the truth of the matter is, is that when we have faith in God, we realize and we understand and we recognize that God is God Almighty. That God is God Sovereign. That God is God alone and that God is in control. And when we have faith in God, we realize that God is the one that provides for you and I. And when we realize that God provides, we know that God will see us through whatever the trial or the situation or the trouble is. Faith in God produces something in our lives. Hope. Hope for tomorrow. Hope to get beyond the circumstance. Hope for our kids. Hope for our money. Hope for our well-being. Hope for, for our happiness. Faith in God begins to produce hope. And hope is what carries us through. We've seen in Hollywood. We've seen through actors. We've seen in, in our own friend's life what, what the lack or the loss of hope does to somebody. 
that they find themselves at the end of their rope, they find themselves with no more answers, with no more solutions, and they take their lives, or they, they, they result, or they, they hide away, or shrink away into drugs, or into alcohol, or whatever it might be, and end up destroying their lives. But you see, faith in God says, God will pull me through. God will see me through. God will carry me through. And because of that faith in God, I have a hope that it may not look good today, but I know that God is in control. And that will keep me going. And because that keeps me going, I can have joy in my life knowing that the trials and the circumstances and the pain and the things that I have to endure today are only for a moment because joy comes in the morning. Joy comes in the morning, as the psalmist said. Faith in God provides hope. In Psalms, the 28th chapter, this is a really neat psalm of David. Psalms chapter, or Psalms 28. Verse number 7, David says these words. This is a psalm of David himself. And he says, the Lord is my strength and my shield. The Lord is my strength and my shield. The Lord is my strength and my shield. It's not about me. It's not about my ability. It's not my ability to endure, to get through this, or I'll just stick it out or hunker down. He says, the Lord is my strength and my shield. And he goes on, my heart trusted in him and I am helped. But look what he says. He says, therefore, love that word, therefore, because that means consequently, because of that, because the very fact that God is my strength and my shield, because the fact that my heart has trusted in Him and I have been helped, because of all of that, my heart greatly rejoices. And with my song, I will praise Him. Because God is our help, because God is our strength, because God is our shield, our heart can rejoice. And rejoicing means joy. Joy in our lives. Joy that is lasting. Joy that when people look at us and say, man, you're going through the worst of the worst. How is it that you can still maintain? How is it that you can still continue on? How is it that you can still trust in God like Job's friends and said, man, curse God and die. Joy because God is my strength and my shield and my heart rejoices even though my life might be broken my heart is rejoicing because my faith is in God. As Israel gathered together in the book of Nehemiah, as they rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem and they're having this celebration, they're having this great celebration and, 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 and Ezra, the, the prophet, reads the, the book of the law. They begin to read this, this, this book of the law and the, the children of Israel begin to weep and they begin to mourn and they realize how far they've strayed. How far away from they had gone and their hearts were heavy. And in Nehemiah, Nehemiah gives them this exhortation. And he says this, and just go ahead and put it up on the overhead. Nehemiah, the eighth chapter, he says, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, send the portions to those whom nothing is prepared. For this is the day holy to our Lord. Why? Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. For the joy of the Lord is is your strength. I remember long ago when I was in youth, I had a friend. Well, truth be told, it was a girlfriend. Sorry, baby. <laughs> she was going through a hard time. Her parents had separated and, 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 and she had literally gone, she had gone into such a state of depression that, that her mom called the police and, and the police took her and they brought her into to Ward B. You know what Ward B is? It's when, when they, the, the CPS and the, the police take you and they kind of watch you, make sure you don't kill yourself. They had taken her, and it was her first time out of Ward B, and she came right to church. And, and she was sitting there. I remember it as vivid as, as it was like it was yesterday. I remember we were sitting there on the curb, and she was just crying. She didn't know what to do. Her life was in shambles. Her mom, who had once served God, was totally opposite of God. Her stepdad that was like her hero, her father figure, was gone, and she just felt like everything was, was wrecked in her life. And I just said, you know, I didn't know what to say to her, so I said, listen, let the joy of the Lord be your strength. Let the joy of the Lord be your strength. And I thought, okay, you know, here's, here's Luke, you know, teenager. I don't know. It's just, I just, I didn't even know where it was in the Bible. I just knew that my mom and my dad always said that. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord shall be my strength. The joy of the Lord. And so I said to her, let the joy of the Lord be your strength. Years later, when, uh, when we had caught up and she was in town or something like that, uh, we just were talking and she had been married and she had had some kids and then she just... I don't know, somehow we crossed. I think she came to church or something like that. She says, I just want you to know that those words you said to me that day on the curb, let the joy of the Lord be my strength. She said, that changed my life. She said, I felt like there wasn't anything that I could hold on to. There wasn't anything in my life that I could have joy about. But when she said, I looked to God, literally it changed my life. 
and I realized that it's not about me, but it's about God. And she said, literally, that is what kept me going in that dark time of my life. To let the joy of the Lord be our strength. Our faith in God produces hope in our lives, an anchor for our soul, as the Bible talks about in Hebrews. Because of that anchor, you and I can have joy, joy that lasts, joy that endures through all things in our own lives. Today is a new day. We might be down, we might be stricken, but we're not forsaken. We might be hard-pressed, but we're not crushed. Why? Because we have a faith in God, that God will come through in our lives, and that tonight brings us joy. Sometimes we allow ourselves to let the day get the best of us, like me yesterday in my toe. The day got the best of me. Sometimes we allow ourselves to wander from the joy of God. Sometimes we allow ourselves to stray away from that which we know brings us lasting joy in pursuit of our own desires. But you know, as long as there's still breath in our lungs, as long as we're still alive in this place today, it's never too late for us to go back to the living God, to follow after Jesus, to see that lasting joy to fill ourselves with the Spirit of God so that we would operate not in the works of the flesh, but in the fruit of the Spirit. To find the Word of God in our lives. To seek out what the Word says about our lives. And to have faith in God. It's never too late. I want to finish by reading this story. Robert Robinson, the author of the hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. He lost a happy communication with the Savior he had once enjoyed. And in his declining years, he wandered into the byways of sin. As a result, he became deeply troubled in spirit. Hoping to relieve his mind, he decided to travel. In the course of his journeys, he became acquainted with a young woman on spiritual matters. And so she asked him what he thought of a hymn that she had been reading. To his astonishment, he found it none other than to be his own composition. He tried to evade her question, but she continued to press him for a response. Suddenly he began to weep. With tears streaming down his cheeks, he said, I am the man who wrote that hymn many years ago. I'd give anything to experience the joy that I knew then. Although she was greatly surprised, she reassured him that the streams of mercy that was mentioned in his song, still flowed. Mr. Robinson was deeply touched, and he turned his wandering heart to the Lord, and he was restored to full fellowship. Oftentimes we find ourselves wavering and wandering and seeking after the joy that comes in the moment, the joy that lasts for just a few moments, years, or months. But ultimately, that which fulfills us is the joy that's lasting. To be able to, be able to let go to wipe out, to flip out, to, 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 to have fun with our food, whatever it might be in that video, is joy that lasts. And that joy comes from God, from following Jesus. That joy comes from filling our lives with the Spirit of God and operating in the fruit of the Spirit. That joy comes by finding the Word of God, by searching it out like the Bereans in the book of Acts, looking at the Word and what does it say? The joy of our lives, that inexpressible joy that Peter talks about, comes by our faith in God, having been found to have faith at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Today, we can have joy, lasting joy in our lives. I saw this quote and I thought it was so neat. You know, whenever the Queen of England presides at the Buckingham Palace, they raise a special flag that says that she resides there. Joy is like the flag raised on the castle of our hearts that says the king is in residence in our hearts. Joy is like a flag raised in the castle of our hearts that says or proclaims that the king is in residence in our heart. That's joy that lasts. Did you guys get something out of the world tonight? Give the Lord a great big praise. Amen. Man, I'll tell you, God is good. Hey, before we leave, I want to just take a quick moment, and I just want to, I want to challenge you, so to speak. I want to challenge you to examine yourself. You see, the Bible tells us that 
a man ought to examine himself from time to time. And as I challenge you this, I just want to just, just ask you a question. First, a favor before the question is, don't get up and don't leave. Don't, don't look at your phone or your emails or Facebook or whatever it might be. Give me a few more moments of your attention because it's so important what we're about to talk about. And the challenge is this. In your own heart, in your own life, what's your answer to this question? If you died tonight and you died, if you walked out of this place and you died, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Super simple question. Nobody's going to know that answer except you and God. Not the person next to you, not your spouse or your best friend or the person that you came with. It's an answer that's only answered to be answered between you and God. You might say, well, Pastor Luke, I, I don't know. You know, I, I, I don't know about all the whole thing. You know, that's a great question because it shows your position of where you stand with God. You might say, well, I hope, I think, I wish. Man, I want, I really, I, I, I always just kind of thought I was going to go to heaven. Did you know that nowhere in the Word of God is it said that you can hope, think, want, wish, hope your way into heaven or want your way into heaven? That God looks at you and says, man, they got the most positive outlook on life. They, 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 had, they, they, they thought they could hard enough, like, I think I can, I think I can. There's nowhere in the Word of God does it say that. You can't get to heaven because you want to. Did you know you can't get to heaven because your parents told you you were a Christian? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you're going to go to heaven because you were baptized or christened as a baby, or because you attended Sunday school or, or, or catechism classes or something like that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you went to children's ministry or youth group or, or, or because you're even in church today. Well, I always thought that people that go to church go to heaven. That, that, that's the whole point, right? You go to church to go to heaven. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you go to church that you're going to find yourself in heaven? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you volunteer or you served in the youth ministry or the children's ministry. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you ushered or, or, or you sang in the choir that you're going to go to heaven. You can't get to heaven those ways. Oftentimes we think this, well, I'm a good person. You know, I, I give to the Red Cross or to the Hay Relief Effort. I, I, you know, I, 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 Apple did that whole product red thing and I've been, I've been giving towards product red to help the AIDS effort in Africa. I mean, I'm a good person. Good people go to heaven. Did you know that nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you're a good person, because you've never robbed a 7-Eleven because you don't drive fast on the freeway, because you do more good in your life than you do bad. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that that's going to get you into heaven? We think, especially in America, that because we do good, because we help our fellow human out, that, that means that we're going to be good enough to get into heaven. But you know that the Bible tells us that our good deeds according to God's righteousness are like filthy rags? You see, nothing you and I could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. Why? Because the Bible tells us over and over and over and over again that we are not saved by our works, by our outward appearance, by what we look like or by what we presume to be. By the titles in which we give ourselves, we are saved by one way and one way only. You see, it's God's heaven. The only way that you and I can get into God's heaven is God's way. And that is Jesus. Jesus says these words. He says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one, listen, no one, he says, goes to the Father except through him. Can't get to heaven any other way but God's way. And that's his son, Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, in the book of John, in the third chapter, Jesus is talking to a real religious man, a leader. A man who was educated in the scripture. A man who did all the right things, said all the right things. And Jesus, you would think, would pat this man on the back. But he says to this man, he says, you must be born again. What does that mean? Well, I'll tell you, it's not what you think. It's not what Hollywood or culture or society's made it out to be born again from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. And the eyes and the heart of God has always meant the same thing. Here it is. Born again means this. It means that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Let me show it to you. First of all, the Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know and believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We sang the song today, I believe in God the Father. I believe in Jesus Christ. The Bible says that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know and believe and even tremble. Yet they're not on their way to heaven. Why? Because there's more than just knowing. There's more than just acknowledging. That's called head knowledge. It's an all or nothing relationship. The Bible says in Romans, the 10th chapter, that we believe unto righteousness. That means that there's something that happens. That means that we've given our heart, we've given our life to Jesus Christ. In the book of Revelation, Jesus says it like this. He says to the church, people like you and I, the church, not the world, the church. I know your works. He goes on and Jesus says, he says, when I come back, I'd rather find you hot or I'd rather find you cold. Because he goes on and he says, because if I find you lukewarm, Jesus says these words. He says, I will vomit you from my mouth. <laughs> Shocking statement. And what Jesus Christ is saying is that lukewarm Christians will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. What does that mean to be lukewarm? Simply put, it means that you're not wholehearted for God. You're not wholehearted against God. You're doing some of your thing, doing some of God's thing. You're like a, you're like a warm soda on a, on a hot day. You don't do the job. It's not cold and refreshing and it's not hot to warm. It's like right in the middle, right in the fence. And Jesus says, if that's you, you're deceived in thinking you're going to make it into the kingdom of heaven. 
And I love you enough, I respect you enough, I honor you enough tonight to tell you the truth. That you can't get to heaven based on your hopes. You can't get to heaven based on your wants or your wishes or your de desires. You can't get to heaven because you do good things. You don't go to heaven because you attend church. Yet, God forgive us in American churches because we've been more interested in people's attendance rather than their souls to, that we've watered the message down. But I love you enough, I respect you enough to challenge you. To rub you the wrong way even if it seems like I'm doing it that way. To tell you the truth that you can't get to heaven based on your own devices. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus says these words. He says that if you confess me before men, he says, I will confess you before my Father. He goes on and he says, but if you deny me, I will deny you. Today I want to give you the opportunity. I want to give you the opportunity to accept what the Bible says is the gift of God, eternal salvation. You see, God loved you and I enough, so much, to give us a free will choice to choose to whether accept or to reject the gift of God through Jesus Christ. It's your choice. We've got to have a right understanding of who God is. God's not in heaven with a two-by-four waiting to whack you over the head. He's not like a little kid on an anthill with a magnifying glass burning you up. God loved you and I so much that He gave Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, to die a beaten, bloody mess on a cross, to bear our sin and our shame, our burdens, so that we could be free of that and we could be reunited with God. And it starts by giving Him our hearts, our lives. Today I want to offer that to you, and then what I'm going to do in just a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one... Two, and on the count of three, I'm going to go, three, smack my hands together, real loud, just like that. Bang! And when I do, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to be bold. And what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to pop your hand up. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, hey, Pastor Luke, I want to give God my heart. Pastor Luke, I want to give God my life. I, that's kind of the person that you were talking about. That, that kind of described me. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, hey, I acknowledge that I want to give Jesus my heart. I want to give Jesus my life. I'm a man. Remember, we talked about that. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'm a man, I'll see. I'll acknowledge you. You can put it right back down. You say, Pastor, if I raise my hand, I might be embarrassed. I don't know if I can do that. The people that I came with and the people that brought me, they're going to know where I am. And I just don't know if I, can, if I can go through that. Let me encourage you. Listen, I'm not going to embarrass you. But even if you were embarrassed because you put your hand up, wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of, of embarrassment than an eternity in hell because you couldn't go forward for God? You see, the Bible says, Jesus says that I came to give you life and life more abundantly. It goes so far beyond what happens when you die. The gift of God and eternal salvation through Jesus Christ begins right here, right now with a life of abundance, life of joy. It starts today by making the decision. Wherever you're at, from the front row to the back row, listen, I don't care if you've been here for 25 years or if this is your first day. It does not matter. What matters is your position with God. Who should raise your hand? If you've never given Him your heart, never given Him your life, in just a moment, pop your hand up. I'll see it. Who should raise your hand? If you're not sure, maybe do this as a, as a child or in the youth group. Maybe you prayed a prayer once or you, you went to a harvest crusade, but you never really followed through with it. Hey, listen, if that's you in just a moment, get ready. Pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. Who should raise your hand? If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God, saying, listen, if you've been running from God instead of to God, you've been playing games, messing around, playing church. Ha, huh, come on. Let's stop messing around. Let's stop playing games with God. I love you enough. I respect you enough. I honor you enough to tell you the truth. Quit playing games with God, and today let's make this the day that you go forward in your relationship with God and find, like we talked about, that joy that lasts the lifetime found in Jesus Christ by accepting the gift of eternal salvation through Jesus. Today, the decision's yours from the front row to the back row. You guys back there in the family room, you hear the sound of my voice? I'm talking to you too. I can see your hands through those windows. If you're out around the campus or at home watching on your phone or on your computer, if that's you in just a moment, hey, get ready. This is your moment. This is your time. You've had doctors and dentists and DMV appointments. Now is a divine appointment between you and God. I'm going to count to three in just a moment. If that's you, get ready to pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down, and we're going to go forward from there, changing destinies together. This is your moment. This is your time. Here we go. You ready? I'm going to count to three. One, two, Three. Let me see those hands in this place today. Say, man, I want to give God my heart. I want to give God my life. One, I see that hand right back there. My friend back there, two. I see my, my friend. Three, I see you right there. No, you can't put her hand up for her. She got to do it on her own. You want to do it or no? Yeah? Kind of? No? Yeah? No? No, you can't put her hand up for her, mom. Three wise people. Anybody else in this place? I wish you could, but you can't. It's a choice. A decision each and every one of us got to make. Four, I see you back there, my man. Four wise people. Anybody else say, man, I, I wonder if I should. I see people pointing over in this direction. Five, I see you back there, my friend. Five wise people. You say, man, I wonder if I should. Anybody else today? Six, I got you. I see you back there. Six wise people. Anybody else? Say, man, I wonder if I should. In the family room? 
Anybody back there in the family or in the foyer, wherever you're at? Hey, this is your moment. This is your time. I'm going to finish it up. I'm going to wrap it up right now. Anybody else? Five, six wise people. Anybody else today? Well, hey, let's praise God for the five wise people. Here's what we're all going to do as we conclude tonight. In just a moment, we're all going to stand. As we do, I want to ask you, please, hey, we're not leaving yet. Very important. If you raise your hand, you got to start following through. You say, man, I want to do this. God, uh, Pastor Luke, I want to give my heart. Is what you're saying. Now it's time to follow through and to give your heart and to give your life to Jesus Christ. And we're going to do that together. We're going to change destinies together here tonight. So if you raise your hand, or you should have raised your hand. Maybe you didn't, but you know you should have. It's okay. It's not too late. Just a moment as we all stand, I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible. A friend, if you need a friend, if you came with somebody, or if somebody brought you, look to them and say, hey, I'll go with you, or hey, come with me. Whatever it might be, get out of your seat, get out of your chair, get into the aisle and come meet me right here. I want to shake your hand. I want to change destinies together with you right here, right now. So let's all stand. Please, nobody leave as they come forward. If you raise your hand, you should have. Come on, get out of your seat, get out of your chair, come meet me right here, right now. I surrender all. You can come. I surrender all. Sing out right here. Unto thee, my blessed You can come, come on. If that's you, we'll welcome them. Come on, welcome them in the house today. Cheer them on. If that's you, if you raise your hand, come on. Come on, brother. You can come. Can I get a high five? Awesome. Hey guys, listen, here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here? His name is Dr. Becker. We call him Dr. B. All right, it's a lot easier to remember. Dr. B's a really cool guy. Here's what he's going to do. He's going to take you guys right over there. Nothing weird goes on, okay? I promise. Nothing weird goes on. He's going to take you guys right over there, and he's going to lead you in a prayer. You don't get saved by raising your hand and say, I want to. Now it's time to ask Jesus to be the Lord and Savior. You say it like this, the leader of your life. So you're going to invite Jesus to come and live in your life and to be filled with that joy. Second thing he's going to do is he's going to, after he leads you in a prayer, he's going to give you some free information, some literature, real easy reading. As you walk out of this place, you say, man, what do I do next? We're going to help point you in the right direction. The third thing he's going to do is he's going to invite you to come back, come hang out with us. We want to teach you some things about the Word of God. We'll meet with you right before service. We'll connect you with a friend. They'll buy you a cup of coffee or sit down with you. Teach you some things about the Word of God to get you strong for a couple of weeks, to get you strong in the things of God so that you don't walk, go back to the life that you're walking away from, but you go forward in what God has for you. So if you would just turn to your left, my right, go right over there with Dr. B. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me. Go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me. And then he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins. That I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin. And I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven, as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.